Thank you all for coming. I know it's uh, a weeknight. You all have other places to be, so I appreciate you coming here. Um, so like Ishara said, I'm Samin Barami. I'm one of the faculty members at UCLA, uh, technically part of the Department of Radiology. But within radiology, there's a subspecialty called interventional radiology. where We actually do image-guided procedures. And our goal is to treat different various uh, conditions with minimally invasive procedures using guidance from different imaging modalities. So that plays a role into uh, my talk today. And uh, I'm actually dual trained in that I do procedures, but I've also specialized in abdominal and pelvic imaging uh, using uh, every modality, CTs, ultrasound, MRIs, x-rays, uh, and that has really helped uh, me in terms of uh, being more effective in terms of the procedures I can offer my patients. So, uh, today's talk is obviously about fibroids, um, and just a, a little bit of information about fibroids in general. They're extremely common. You know, in some populations, up to one in four women have fibroids. That doesn't necessarily mean that they all know that they have them. Uh, a, a percentage of women with fibroids end up becoming symptomatic, uh, especially within the African American population. Up to 70% of women are known to have fibroids. And fibroids are basically a benign, non-malignant, non-cancerous uh, small tumor that, or large tumor that occurs within the uterus. It's made up of the muscle cells uh, that make up the uterus. So uh, in, when you look in the literature, up to 40% of women do potentially develop symptoms related to these fibroids. And it's really only at that time that they come to light. They may have otherwise never known that they have them. Now, the main symptoms that we, uh, that we see women presenting with are either relating to heavy bleeding or the mass effect or the bulk symptoms of these fibers that have just outgrown their space within the pelvis. So those pains, uh, the, the mass effect symptoms are usually um, presented as pain or pressure, sometimes with urinary symptoms where the fibroid is sitting on top of the bladder and the woman feels the need to go uh, to the bathroom very frequently. And occasionally, actually very commonly within uh, the, the population of women who's trying to conceive, um, a fibroid in the wrong location within the uterus can cause infertility. So within the U.S., it is actually one of the most common causes of hysterectomy uh, across the board. In private practices, academic uh, locations, women end up getting hysterectomies primarily for fibroids. Um, and hysterectomy, it's a pretty big surgery. It requires removing of an organ. So there's a lot of morbidity or recovery time associated with it. And a lot of women are out of work for during that recovery time, up to six weeks after hysterectomy. And obviously, for anyone who wants to conceive or become pregnant in the future, without the uterus, they are uh, rendered infertile. And the actual cost across the board for hysterectomy related to fibroids is quite high um, in the millions across the United States. So that's just an image of an intra, uh, it's within the OR, and the ob gyne here has opened up the abdomen, and that is one of the larger spectrum fibroids that we see. That whole thing is a fibroid. How, how, how large is it? Excuse me. How large is it? That one probably goes above the umbilicus. Uh, here's the umbilical button. So usually when we, we talk about the uterus in terms of pregnancy weeks, so it's probably like a 30-week pregnant uterus, maybe like an eight or nine month pregnancy. So the general paradigm in terms of treating fibroids in most places is the patient comes in, gets evaluated by a gynecologist who may or may not perform an ultrasound in the office and may see so what they decide is a fibroid. And from there, they're offered either hormones, a hysterectomy, or in some cases, a myomectomy, which is basically just a surgical removal of that single fibroid. So that's a, the traditional paradigm for treating fibroids. But at UCLA, what we've done is we've collaborated between the field of radiology and ob and we've basically formed a multidisciplinary clinic. So now when a woman comes in, they're seen by both the interventional radiologist and the ob and we provide them all of their options, multiple options within the same setting, and we really educate our patients about what are fibroids, are they really the cause of their symptoms, 
And if they are, then we offer them the treatment options. And if they're not, we really try to figure out what is causing those symptoms. Because it's, it's important to decide uh, to determine the cause-effect relationship before you go and perform a procedure. So our paradigm at UCLA always begins with MR imaging. You may have heard about ultrasounds, which is basically a very uh, operator dependent. Whoever is performing the ultrasound may make a fibroid or whatever else is in the pelvis look a certain way, measure a certain size, and it's different depending on who's performing it each time. With MR imaging, it's extremely uh, objective. So it will delineate the number of fibroids, the location of fibroids, and the types of fibroids regardless of which MR scanner you're laying on. So it, it is truly a paradigm shift because we have decided that certain types of fibroids respond well to certain types of treatments. And not all fibroids are treated equally. And MRI is basically the best way to delineate all these, uh, all these issues. It's extremely reproducible. So say I'm concerned about the rate of growth of a fibroid. If I get a baseline MRI today and get another one at six months, I can measure accurately how fast is this fibroid growing. Whereas with something like ultrasound, like I said, it's very technique uh, dependent, depending on who's doing the, the ultrasound. And again, it characterizes the fibroids. It also distinguishes some of the common mimics of fibroids, because not all causes of pelvic pain and heavy bleeding are necessarily fibroids. So here's an example of an MRI. This is uh, looking at the patient from the side view. This over here is the spine, and this is the uterus. The abdomen is over here, and the legs are pointing down. So we're looking at the woman from the side. And most of the images I'm going to show you today are going to be a side view like this, just to orient you. So you can see that um, this is an extremely large fibroid. This white thing down here is the bladder. And within the fibroid are a lot of different shades of, um, of fibroids here. You can see there's a large one here, a couple over here, several over here. And the non-pregnant uterus usually lives down here. So you can see this is significantly enlarged. So this is an example of how fibers can ex expand the size of the uterus and cause all those mass effects, the pressure and pain symptoms. And on this MRI, the actual um, color or shade of the, the signal characteristics of the fibroids tell me as a radiologist and an interventionalist what kind of fibroids are these and how can I best treat them. So here's another example um, with fibroids, uh, as I mentioned, location is very important. So here's an example of what we call a submucosal fibroid. This white line here is actually the inner cavity of the uterus. For a pregnant woman, that's the space that a, a, a fetus would grow in. And you can see this fibroid is intracavitary. It sits within that inner cavity of the uterus and causes associated symptoms. Usually fibroids that are touching or invading into the inner cavity of the uterus are the ones that we like to blame for the heavy bleeding symptoms. If you had the same size fibroid, but it was sitting out here, not touching this part, and you came to me telling me you have heavy bleeding, I would say that fibroid probably is not the cause of your problems. But something like this is probably causing quite heavy bleeding. So here's a couple of different um, examples of different types of fibroids. This is uh, the kind of MR image this is. It's a T2 sequence. And on T2, fluid is very bright. So here's a bladder filled with urine. I know it's a T2 sequence because the bladder is very bright. So what I look at on MRI is the signal characteristics, the darkness of the fibroid on this sequence. So here, these are very dark fibroids, and this is very bright fibroids. And when they've uh, taken these out on surgery and sliced them up and looked at them under a microscope, there's actual different characteristics between the two different types of fibroids. It also implies which um, treatment options that I'm going to discuss are going to work for which, which kind of fibroid. So this is a very, very common mimic of fibroids. This patient also presents with pelvic pain that's worse during menstrual, her menstrual cycles. She has extremely heavy bleeding, but when I get this MRI, I know automatically she does not have fibroids. This uterus is also extremely enlarged. It's going up probably to the level of the umbilicus. And the muscle is very expanded. The whole thing is very large. But unlike the other images I've shown you, you, ha you don't see little round lesions within the myometrium, the, the muscle of the uterus. You see a very diffuse process that involves every wall, every part of the, 
uh, the, the uterus. And this is a condition we call adenomyosis. We can diagnose it with MRI. It's extremely difficult to diagnose with ultrasound, but adenomyosis is basically a huge mimicker of fibroids and has very significant um, differences in terms of how it's treated. So again, here's another example. I know it's adenomyosis because of the way the, the muscle of the uterus looks. It has all these very small uh, white spots within it. Uh, that's uh, the glandular tissue within um, the uterus that is invaded into the muscle. Whereas a fibroid is made up of smooth muscle cells, uh, this is actual glandular tissues. The lining of the inner part of the uterus has invaded into the mu uh, muscle cells. And it's very hormonally active, so during menstrual cycles, this tissue can expand, it can hemorrhage, it can cause heavy bleeding. Now, interestingly, adenomyosis and fibroids often coexist. So it's very important, um, based on MRI, to decide which one is the one that's most likely causing the symptoms that the patient comes in with. Is it the mass effect from the fibroid, or is it a small amount of adenomyosis they have, or is it a combination? In this person, you can see they have diffuse adenomyosis and a fibroid down here. So here's our um, approach to fibroid treatment at UCLA. We, like I said, we have a multidisciplinary approach. We start with the MR imaging, first of all, to delineate everything we just discussed. Is it really fibroids that are causing the symptoms? And then our OB-GYN colleagues discuss in detail all the surgical options, hysterectomy, myomectomy, both of which can be done in minimally invasive ways, laparoscopically or transvaginally. And then I myself discuss the non-surgical options with patients. So in terms of non-surgical options, we'll start by talking about uterine artery embolization. Some of you may have heard about this. This uh, is a very well-established procedure. It was first described in 1995 in France for the treatment of fibroids. Originally, even before 1995, people had used this technique to stop hemorrhage in uh, postpartum uh, women who had bleeding complications from deliveries. And it just happened that in that patient population, they noticed that anyone that they did this procedure in, their fibroids got smaller and their symptoms that were related to the fibroids got better. So they actually went ahead and did uh, some research studies. Um, the first group of patients was about 16 patients um, who had fibroids and were treated with this procedure and their symptoms significantly improved. In the US, um, this was first done at UCLA uh, in 1999, Dr. Goodwin really um, spearheaded this effort and treated a, a group of women and 47 women. And again, the results were extremely reproducible. Symptoms got better. So the other thing that, the other reason radiologists are so involved in this field of treatment is because um, we like to quantify symptoms. Okay, we, everything we do, we try to do in a well-validated uh, way. We don't just bring you back into clinic and say, how do you feel now that you've had the procedure? We actually have to uh, fill out very um, well-established surveys, quality of life surveys. Because fibroids are a benign entity, they're not cancer. You don't need to take it out if, you don't, if they're not bothering you. We really need to make sure that when we treat a patient, it's indicated. So we have um, this uh, quality of life survey that was actually de uh, developed by radiologists who do this procedure that helps us delineate how much are these fibroids affecting your quality of life. And that's how we decide, are the benefits of this procedure outweighing the risk of the procedure? And you can see that a lot of the women we come into our uh, clinic filling out the surveys, their scores are off the chart. They have been dealing with these symptoms for a very long time and for some reason have just thought that it's okay to be bleeding and hemorrhaging every single month, becoming anemic from it, having pelvic pain. But once we actually see it quantified in a survey, they understand this is not okay. Their quality of life could be significantly improved. And that helps us decide, yes, that's an appropriate patient to treat. So Dr. Spee is also one of the spearheads in this effort, um, went ahead and did a, a large study, 200 patients, and showed that, again, as we get longer term data, up to five years, um, a lot of these women, more than 70% of them had symptom relief within, uh, during that long period of time. So as the years have gone on, we have shown that the symptom relief from uterine artery embolization is quite long lasting. 
and Dr. Goodwin went ahead and uh, developed a fibroid registry through the Society of Interventional Radiology where he followed over a thousand patients who were treated with these and over 80% of women had significantly reduced symptoms. Now there's a lot of urban myths about uterine artery embolization. The longer something's been around, the longer uh, people can have misconceptions about it uh, based on one or two case reports here and there. And so these are some of the most common, um, uh, common myths. For example, some people think that uh, uterine artery embolization will not work in very large fibroids. Some people think that um, you absolutely uh, will have some kind of sexual dysfunction after this procedure. Uh, other people are worried that uh, treating intracavitary or fibers that are within the uterine uh, cavity can cause severe complications. So our job as the people who do this procedure are to one by one address each of these uh, potential you know, concerns that patients come in with. And the most common ones relate to size. A lot of people, a lot of misconception among even gynecologists in the community is that when a uterus has too many fibroids or the fibroids are too big, this is not the correct procedure. But we have long-term data showing that, um, and this is one example of it, uh, the reason that this misconception came about, it was an or original study that showed that pe people with large fibroids may have worse complications, such as infection. So we actually um, have done studies comparing side-by-side -side women with small uteruses, small fibroids, women with large uteruses and large fibroids, and how much we need, to, how aggressive we need to be with the procedure between the two, and we looked at the complication rates after each, and there was no significant difference. The biggest difference is that the symptoms resolved, it just took, so, it took a little bit longer, okay? So the, the studies that we've published in the literature show that uterine artery embolization, there's really no size limit. It's uh, really depending on the woman and her preference for having her uterus removed or not having it removed. Now adenomyosis, there's some misconception out there that uterine autoembolization will not treat adenomyosis. Um, fibroids, as you've seen, have surgical options, hormonal options in terms of treating them, and a lot of interventional options that I'm gonna discuss. Adenomyosis traditionally has been treated with hysterectomy. Because it's not a mass that can just be scooped out of the uterus, the most gynecologists out there, when they diagnose adenomyosis, offer hysterectomy saying the only way to resolve your symptoms is to remove this uterus. And that is true in some women, that's probably the best choice. But we have done further studies using uterine artery embolization, specifically in women who have adenomyosis, showing that they also have significant symptom relief. Now the biggest difference is that um, we have some long-term data showing here, we need to modify our procedure in how we treat adenomyosis versus fibroids in order to get the same degree of symptom relief. So here I'll just describe the procedure itself a little bit. Uterine artery embolization. Embolization is the technical term for saying blocking the blood supply. So the way I perform this procedure, I enter a blood vessel in the right groin, put a small tube or catheter into the blood vessels going into the uterus, and I basically park my catheter really close to the uterus so I'm protecting all the surrounding structures, and I'm really just treating the fibroids at the uterus level and I infuse tiny little particles, inert little particles um, that have been well tested, no problems with them, and they get lodged within the uterus, pref preferentially within the fibroid, and block the blood supply. And as a fibroid gets blocked, there's no more oxygen going to it, it stops growing. And better than that, it starts shrinking. So we have data going several years out using MR imaging, showing that the benefit of uterine artery embolization outlasts the first couple years fibroids continue to shrink for several years afterwards, and a lot of them end up just being a small scar within the uterus. Do they fall out after, after they're dead? No. The, the, one of the misconceptions about uterine artery embolization is that certain types of fibroids can't be treated with it safely. For example, pedunculated fibroids, fibroids that are on a tiny little stalk, uh, there was some concern that these will twist <coughs> off and fall off. But we, with MR imaging, we select patients, make sure the stalk is nice and thick, and those women do just fine. The body is amazing. It starts resorbing it as if it's scar tissue, just the way your, your body resorbs a scab on the skin until it's very small and literally just a small scar. Um, the fibroids that are hanging into the uterine cavity 
a lot of times the body just sheds it. So women end up having a little bit of heavy period afterwards for a couple of months as the body is shedding that tissue. Um, and then the fibroid is gone basically. Rarely uh, does a fibroid actually fall off and need to be taken out by a gynecologist. But again, I would know that information based on MR imaging. And for a woman who just has an isolated fibroid within the uterine cavity, that might uh, be a uh, hysteroscopic resection where they go in through the cervix and just lop it out is probably a better option. Okay. So here, um, by modifying the way I do this procedure uh, for adenomyosis, I use smaller particles, go uh, be a little bit more aggressive with it. We end up getting pretty similar uh, fibroid relief symptoms between the two groups of a uh, woman who have adenomyosis and adenomyosis and fibroids. You can see though that women with fibroids are much easier to treat in terms of getting their symptom scores to decrease. Adenomyosis is a much more resistant um, uh, entity. So the other misconception about uterine artery embolization is its effects on fertility. Now, if you are a 25-year-old woman who has fibroids, I don't necessarily recommend uterine artery embolization to you because you may want to have children in the future. There, but it's, as it happens, we're having a lot of younger patients coming to us with symptomatic fibroids, but they say that we want, and they want to get pregnant in the future. So it's really important to tease out the literature as to whether it's safe to do this or not. Now, I can tell you to date, there's a lot of women who have gotten pregnant successfully after uterine artery embolization. More than 50% of women who wanted to get pregnant ended up getting pregnant. There's some literature suggesting that UFE, U, uterine artery embolization may have some complications. For example, at the very, very extreme end of complications, if the woman gets infected and needs a uterus removed, obviously they can't have children. But again, the, the way we do the procedure, the way we treat with antibiotics, the risk for infection, at least at our institution, is less than 0.5%. Less than um, the other risk that people may read about is premature menopause. Because the original way this procedure was performed, there was some thought that maybe the ovaries were also affected by the procedure. But we've modified the procedure, go even closer to the uterus with smaller catheters. So the, the women that we've been treating have not had any incidence of amenorrhea. Within the less than 1% of women who do stop having their periods, uh, it's usually the women who are already very close to menopause. So what we do at our institution is right before we do the procedure, we do a blood test, and right afterwards we do a blood test that checks the function of the ovaries. And unanimously across the board, we haven't had any direct hits to the ovary. Okay. Um, and then there were some reports that uterine artery embolization might, affect, might cause uh, pregnancy complications like preterm delivery, malpresentations of the fetus, miscarriages, or placental abnormalities. Now the confounding factor is when we go and compare women with fibroids who don't have anything done, and women with fibroids who get uterine artery embolization, a lot of the pregnancy rates, the complication rates are exactly the same. So it's really hard for us to say the uterine artery embolization is causing these pregnancy complications when the women who have had um, uh, these fibroids are already at a lower fertility, fertility level, depending on the location of the fibroids. This is just saying that women with fibroids at baseline are less likely to become pregnant. Within the infertile population, a lot of them do have fibroids. So what patients need to know is that if there, you know, there are some complications of uterine artery embolization that I delineate for every patient that I see who wants to get pregnant. And I always, always tell them, if you have just a couple of fibroids and you definitely want to get pregnant in the future, consider myomectomy. Because there has been some literature suggesting that T just you know, scooping out the, those one or two fibroids preserves the uterus in such a way that it's more likely to have a normal pregnancy, at least within the first two years that we follow these women. It seems like myomectomy is the recommended option. Now, the woman who um, refused surgery, we just discuss this in detail with them and tell them, we don't know what your fertility rate is going to be afterwards. About 50% of women get pregnant, okay? Um, now, some women just aren't candidates for myomectomy. For example, if they have more than 50 fibroids within the uterus, well, that, that uterus you saw in that original image where the, it was all the way up to here, 
To be honest, that uterus probably can't carry a pregnancy. And taking out that much volume of fibroids doesn't leave a lot of um, muscle behind to have a functional uterus. There is quite a bit of literature showing that the muscle remodels quite a bit. And you know, up to a certain amount, they can take out the fibroids. But some women just aren't um, optimal candidates for myomectomy. And those women, uterine artery embolization can definitely play a role. Now, the other non-surgical option that we have to offer is MR-guided focused ultrasound. Now, this is truly non-invasive, whereas with uterine artery embolization, there is a, you, you, know, you um, end up having a little band-aid on the groin. This one has no incisions, no puncture sites, nothing. And the way we do this is, just as you see here, the patient lies down flat on the MRI, and the procedure is done in that, in that manner. Is that an open MRI? Do you have to put your head in? No, the way we do the procedure, your head never goes all the way in. It's just like she's positioned, her head is always outside. So claustrophobia, claustrophobia doesn't play so much of an issue. Now I should mention for both of these procedures, MR guided focused ultrasound and uterine artery embolization, there's no need for general anesthesia. Whereas any surgical options require you to be intubated completely asleep, um, these procedures are done under what's called conscious sedation where you're sort of in a twilight sleep, we just give you some uh, relaxing medications and pain medications so you're comfortable throughout the procedure. Now, what is MR-guided focused ultrasound? It's basically using ultrasound waves, there's no radiation, it's ultrasound waves that are focused into one spot and cause heat and burn the tissue. That's called an ablation. Uh, an ablation is basically burning tissue. It is non-invasive, it's done through the skin, um, and it's MR guided. You know, the patient is positioned within the MR scanner and the ultrasound um, machine is built into the MR scanner. There's a couple of different systems available right now. The one that's FDA approved in the US is in SciTech and that's the one we have at UCLA. Here's a little schematic showing that uh, the woman lies down, um, belly down into this uh, on the MR table. And here's a little water bath. Uh, ultrasound waves, anyone who's had any kind of ultrasound done before, you know that you need a little bit of gel between the ultrasound probe and your skin because it doesn't travel through air. So instead of gel, what we use is water and that allows the ultrasound beams to travel through the water. The ultrasound transducer is built into the table, the patient never sees it, and it basically focuses the beam into the uterus and treats the fibroid. It's very similar to the way magnifying glass works with light. It just focuses the beams into one spot. How long do you have to blind like that? So that depends on the size and number of fibroids. Um, usually we don't have you laying like that for more than three hours, but it is a very long procedure. Okay? It's usually a long procedure, and I'll explain. One to two hours? Depends on the size. You know, if it's just a two centimeter fibroid, that's, you know, half hour, right? But if you have what most of the women we see have, which is like an eight centimeter fibroid, you're taking a little nap on that table, okay? <laughs> we give you plenty of medication so you're nice and comfortable. No. Embolization was a previous one where it just takes maybe an hour or so uh, and you're laying on your back and I'm working in the groin right here. This is a much newer technology just within the la less than uh, five, six years that we've really been doing it. Um, so the literature we have on this, we don't have the 10-year follow-up, for example, that we have with uterine artery embolization, mm -hmm. but it's all very promising. Does it become sterile after that? No. Is no. it painful? Um, there is a little bit of pain, but we give you medication, so the, all the women I've treated have been very comfortable during the procedure. And is, is it a, an outpatient procedure? Mm -hmm. Does someone have to drive you home? Yes. yes. Anytime we give any kind of sedation uh, for any kind of procedure, uh, we prefer that someone drives you home. Yeah. Can you go to work the next day? Well, I've had a woman do that, yes. Depends on what kind of work. If you're a marathon runner, I don't recommend it. But a woman with desk jobs, within the first uh, day or two, they're back at their work. With uterine artery embolization, we require one night stay in the hospital just to help. Uh, a lot of times there's cramping pain and we like to give you pain medications. And with that one, um, it's not so much recovering from the actual procedure, it's that a lot of women feel a little tired. Uh, they feel a little under the weather for about seven days or so. So for that one, I recommend just taking it easy for about a week. So when do you start seeing results? 
So um, I can go through and show you the um, exactly what it does and how we see results. Uh, this is basically a schematic. It might be a little bit um, a little bit <coughs> hard to see there. Uh, basically, within the crystal that's built into the table, there's multiple uh, different elements that are producing these sound waves. And are and what I'm doing outside using the software program is I'm focusing these sound waves into different spots. And so what happens is, uh, as I'm doing that, the MR scanner is al allowing me real-time evaluation of how effective is this. It gives me thermal feedback. By doing MR imaging, I can actually get functional information. I can see how hot the tissue is getting. And these are our heat curves um, <coughs> over here. And we want it to get to a certain heat level before I know that, yes, it has worked. So it's not radiation? This is not radiation. Absolutely not. So what happens to this tumor? So, funny you should ask, here is a uterus with a very large fibroid in it. I've divided it up uh, using my software program into a very tiny little um, cigar shaped areas and I've burned each one of those. And in this case, they actually, um, this is uh, from the literature, they actually took out this uterus and looked at that area that was treated with focus ultrasound and you can see that tissue is dead. Okay, so it's burned the tissue, it's no longer getting oxygen, it's no longer growing. So when tissue dies like that, the body immediately starts resorbing it. Does okay. it back? So fibroids, like anything else, if I were to treat this, um, uh, this fibroid the way it was done here, and I leave this big rind around, yes, it will grow back. Because anytime you leave cells behind, they were prone to outgrowing their, their space, they will continue to grow. So my goal with every fibroid is to treat them to completion. And with, you know, alternatively with uterine artery embolization, that treats every fibroid completely, whereas with this one, it's much more meticulous. I have to plan it out very carefully to try to get as much of it as possible. So I won't look three months pregnant anymore. <laughs> well, it will take a little bit of time to shrink, right. but that is the goal. And w the literature is still a little bit early in terms of the maximal shrinkage, but if it's, if it's gonna continue in the trajectory that we see, it will shrink down quite a bit over time. But what's the over time? Like? So um, I'm gonna get to that in just a second because we have some uh, early information about that. So again, this is a table, the patient lies down on it, the, the ultrasound is built into the table, and then here's uh, the software, this is the way it works out. We sit outside the room while the patient is in the scanner, and we basically tr um, plan out uh, this. Um, is it a noisy MRI? You get headphones. Oh. The, the noise is only for the brief times that we're imaging, and we give you headphones to just make sure you're nice and comfortable. This is that thermal mapping we're talking about. As I'm burning a spot within the fibroid, you can see it gets brighter and brighter and that correlates with how hot the tissue is getting. And once it goes above um, 60 degrees Celsius, I know that I've just achieved cellular death and that tissue is no longer viable. And each one of these cigar shaped uh, regions that I uh, divide up the fibroid into is called a sonication. So depending on how big the fibroid is, the larger the number of sonications I need to perform, and that's what extends the procedure sometimes up to three hours. What do you, what do you give these about? Do they give you a catheter? Yeah, there's a catheter in place to make you nice and comfortable. So here again, you can see that we treated this fibroid. We gave some contrast to the vein to see how much of the fibroid is still alive and picking up contrast, and the parts that we burned are no longer picking up the contrast, telling me that that is an effective treatment. So here's some examples of what you were asking about in terms of how much shrinkage can you get. So here's a woman, very, very large fibroid. Um, this was over 500 cc's. It went up just below the umbilicus. And we imaged her uh, over several months. Within a month, it had shrunk uh, a little bit from here to here. And then 36 months after, it had continued to shrink, but not quite as much. <coughs> so now when we treat um, such large fibroids that where the woman was probably on the table, you know, the full three hours. Uh, what we prefer to do is pre-procedure pre shrink down the fibroid. And the way we do that is with a hormone. Um, uh, so I'll talk about that in just a second. This is just another example of how well the, the burning of the fibroid uh, allowed us to treat this um, 
uh, this lesion where it just doesn't pick up any more of the contrast. And you can see we really spared the normal muscle of the uterus and really targeted our treatment just uh, to the area limited to the fibroid. Um, so it said uh, 36, how long is that 36? 36 months. months. How many treatments in 36 months? This one I think was just one treatment. Yeah. One treatment, it continues to... Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Once we've, we've treated the lesion, requiring another treatment is very rare. Unless at the time of, I know that, you know what, I've maxed out how much time I want you on the scanner. There's just so much more fibroid. Let's divide it up into two sessions. But that's something I would know based on the pre-procedure MRI, just based on the size of the fibroid. Um, but most, most women, we try to treat in one session. And using the, that hormone that I discussed is called Lupron. Uh, we, a lot of women who may have required multiple sessions, we shrink down to a size where we can effectively treat it within one session. Okay. How do you spell that hormone? L-U-P-R-O-N. Does that have side effects? Yes. So <laughs> the reason that everyone in the world is, doesn't treat themselves with Lupron to shrink their fibroids is because it simulates menopause. What it does, it blocks the communication between the brain and the ovary and makes the body think it's in menopause. And as you may know, most uterine problems resolve with menopause because there's no more hormonal uh, stimulation. So fibroids shrink, adenomyosis shrinks, and they just re you know, have no more symptoms. Um, so what we do is we simulate that with an injection for three months, one injection um, uh, one per month for three months, and that allows significant, almost 40 to 50% shrinkage of the uh, fibroid and right after that uh, third month mark, we put you on the scanner and treat you because the second we stop giving you the hormone, the fibroid will, shr uh, will grow again. And some of the symptoms associated with it are what you would expect with menopause, hot flashes, some mood um, issues. Yes? Is this for postmenopause women also? Well, technically we can treat any woman with symptomatic fibroids, whether they're pre or postmenopausal. Now, if someone is already postmenopausal, a lot of times their symptoms have been relieved. Now, if they are postmenopausal and on hormone therapy, their symptoms will probably continue, their fibroids may continue to grow, their bleeding may still be heavy. Um, but, you know, postmenopausal women, usually their symptoms have resolved. If they haven't, it's a case by case situation where we really make sure it is a fibroid that's causing their symptoms. The MR imaging becomes even more important, make sure there's nothing else going on, and then we tailor our treatment for them. But yes, you can and have you the procedure without the loop on. I'm sorry? You can have that procedure without the loop on? Yeah, yeah, you can have it, and again, it just depends on what kind of fibroid do you have, what is the size of your fibroid. Okay? Um, now, I, we talked a lot about different types of fibroids. That comes into play with both uterine artery embolization and MR-guided focused ultrasound. You remember I showed you an image where one fibroid was very dark on the T2 images and one was very bright? As it happens, the dark ones respond extremely well to MR-guided focused ultrasound. The bright ones, I've tried many, many hours and they just don't respond quite as well. The, this effect that you see, this beautiful effect where there's no more tissue within this, it almost looks like a black hole. We just don't get such a beautiful effect with certain types of fibroids. It causes a different difference in color. So it's a type of cells and the, the amount of cells within uh, the fibroid, how packed they are and how much fluid there is in there. Uh, it's really a pathologic um, differentiation, but at least MR imaging tells us right off the bat that, yeah, this one will probably respond well and this one won't. So we won't waste your time knowing that it might not respond. So these are examples of fibroids that have been treated with MR-guided focused ultrasound. This woman had uh, a lot of pressure symptoms associated with her fibroids and uh, right after we treat, we get this MR imaging that shows that yes, we were effective in treating most of it. Um, now the position of the fibroid also determines if we can do this procedure or not. The reason uh, we get the MRI beforehand is to delineate the type of fibroid, but we also get the MRI with a woman on her belly on the scanner. And that really simulates what is the natural location of the uterus in relation to the abdominal wall. Because I can treat this fibroid when it's sitting right up against the abdominal wall, but if there's a loop of bowel in front of it, then I know either I can't treat it safely or I have to do certain maneuvers to move that loop of bowel beside. And we have been quite creative in getting things out of the way so we can go ahead and treat 
uh, effectively, but it just helps in terms of planning, getting that MRI. And then also, if you have a fibroid that's all the way back in the pelvis, right up against the sacrum, the, your tailbone area, there's a lot of nerves back there. So with those ones, we're very careful. We don't want to uh, cause any nerve damage or uh, damage to the surrounding structures. So that's also something we would discuss after getting the MRI. Now, um, this is what I was discussing, that we give the Lupron for women. And, you know, some women have such bad symptoms and have such an aversion to surgery or any other kind of minimally invasive procedure that they say, you know what, I can handle three months of the symptoms because I know this procedure will help me. So here's a large fibroid. And after um, Lupron, it has shrunk to maybe about half the size, whereas this would be four hours of treating. This is probably two hours of treating. Depends. Depends on how much of it is calcified and you know there's a spectrum for everything. If the whole thing is calcified then that's going to be very hard to treat because that fibroid has already done part of the work for itself. It's degenerated and calcified that tissue. Calcification is not a growing kind of tissue. It's something that's already degenerated quite a bit. Um, it means that either it's outgrown its supply. We see calcified fibroids a lot after menopause, for example, but some women, their fibroids are just so large uh, that portions of it outgrew its blood supply, for example, and it degenerated. And fibroids can degenerate in several ways, well, where they either become cystic, where they just, uh, it's not um, solid tissue anymore, it's fluid tissue. Some of them calcify, where it's hard rock-like material. Um, and others that continue to grow and have soft tissue within them, and those are the ones that are the easiest to treat. The calcified ones, we would ha really have to look at the anatomy of the fibroid and see how much of it is calcified. Because if it's a fibroid and it just has a little speck of calcification there, that's a non-issue. I can treat the rest of it. But if you uh, show me a fibroid where most of it is calcified, that's going to be very difficult to treat. How do you treat those? The calcified ones? So depending on what kind of symptoms are causing, surgery is always an option. Um, but again, I'd have to know the type and location and all of that. Okay. So um, some of the literature that we've gotten so far with MR guided flow cell ultrasound, like I told you, this is a newer technology. Um, we have had quite a bit of um, shrinkage, uh, up to 100 cc's, for example. Now, depending on how many fibroids we are um, treating, the actual volume of the uterus will take some time to shrink because each fibroid will have to shrink in its own uh, way. Um, but more importantly, a lot of women get uh, very concerned about the size of the fibroid. What we've noticed is by using our surveys, we have women fill out the surveys before any kind of procedure we do and afterwards. Across the board, their symptoms in terms of their score decrease. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the MRI after the procedure and their symptom scores, they don't always correlate. Meaning that a very large fibroid may have really only shrunk, you know, 30, 40 percent, but for some reason the symptom relief, according to this sur survey that the woman fills out, is significantly more impressive than the actual MRI. So the way that, we, that I like to rationalize that is because not only is this fibroid shrinking, but it's stopped growing. And you've had this fibroid for a very long time. It's not like you had a one centimeter fibroid last week and this week you have a 10 centimeter fibroid. It only reached a mass, a threshold mass where it started causing pressure symptoms or bleeding once it went above a certain size. And by getting it just to below that size, symptoms significantly improve. And that was also shown that there's a, oh, at least a 10 uh, point reduction um, in terms of uh, the symptoms uh, relief in these women. And you can see this was uh, just a graph demonstrating the symptom relief by three months after a procedure was done. And these symptoms include both bleeding symptoms and mass effect symptoms. The survey is comprehensive of both. 
So today, more than 4,000 women have been treated. They have had significant improvements in their symptom scores. That's why we still offer this procedure. It continues to prove that it is uh, an effective treatment. Um, and then within the African-American population, more than 95% of women uh, ended up getting significant symptom relief. In terms of fertility, an area that this uh, you know, technology is really emerging and looking very promising is that whereas before I told you for a very young patient who wants to have pregnancies, I try to veer them towards myomectomy. Now we have some uh, literature suggesting that MR guided focus ultrasound may be just as good as myomectomy. Again, we need some more long-term data, but the FDA is required that we report every single pregnancy that occurs after this procedure. And to date, over 117 women have, who um, wanted to get pregnant have been able to get pregnant and have gone on to have um, normal deliveries. The biggest difference with myomectomy is once a uterus has been operated on, that woman is committed to a C-section they can never have a normal vaginal delivery. Whereas with MR guided focused ultrasound, a lot of them ended up having normal vaginal deliveries. So, um, you know, it's a non-invasive procedure. So hysterectomy, open hysterectomy at the very opposite end of the spectrum requires several weeks of recovery time. Whereas this procedure, no general anesthesia, no incision to recover from, your body does all the hard work on its own by resorbing that tissue over time as you're going along uh, doing whatever, you know, you, you're nor carry on your own normal lifestyle. And it just uh, shows that uh, women after these minimally invasive procedures have ended up having fewer clinic visits for complications, fewer additional procedures, and fewer uh, additional diagnostic procedures to see what else is going on. So the best fibroid for MR guided focused ultrasound, like I said, is T2-dark. It's a dark fibroid on my MRI. It's preferably less than seven centimeters, or I can preferably shrink it down to seven centimeters. And if there's multiple fibroids, preferably the max sum of those adds up to about seven, eight centimeters, okay? Um, and the uterus uh, is sitting uh, forward in the abdomen right up against the abdominal wall. So given all the options we've discussed, there's now this new paradigm in terms of treating um, fibroids. Before, as I said, the patient would go to uh, the gynecologist and get treated either with hormones, hysterectomy, or myomectomy, but now we have a couple of new options relatively new, uterine artery embolization and MR guided focused ultrasound. And as I said, at UCLA, we've expanded that paradigm. We always get an MRI. And we've really logistically try to improve this by, you know, most of our women are working women. We try to do everything in one day. We bring you in, get your MRI within the hour you're seen, where we review the MRI with you in the clinic, show you the images, show you exactly what, uh, what is causing your symptoms. And then the gynecologist and myself Go ahead and discuss all of your options with you and really help you decide which one is best for your lifestyle, which one is uh, best for your fibroid type. And, you know, about half of women end up requiring surgery just because it just, depending on what's going on in their pelvis, and about half of women ha uh, have a preference for the interventional procedures. And even with surgery, you still don't have to have a hysterectomy? Mm -mm. Depends on what's going on in the uterus. So but my amygdala, they can grow back. Yeah, so any procedure that preserves the uterus preserves the muscle of the uterus. And a uterus that has shown that it likes to grow fibroids always has the propensity to grow fibroids. Now, you know, with uterine artery embolization, I've blocked the blood supply to the uterus. So even though the muscle is alive, the likelihood of the woman growing another fibroid that grows to the point where it causes symptoms again before menopause, for example, in the next 10 years or so, is pretty low. Very few women require more than one uterine artery embolization. With myomectomy, it literally goes out after a single fibroid and scoops that one out and then scoops another one out and doesn't touch the rest of it and occasionally a little bit of the fibroid is left behind. So in those women, yes, the recurrence rate within the next five years or so is a little bit higher. The MR guided focused ultrasound is very similar to myomectomy in that way, where I'm only treating part of the uterus. I'm only treating a targeted uh, fibroid, and I might decide at the time that that large fibroid is the one causing your symptoms, and that little one centimeter one way in the back of the uterus that I can't reach, we might just leave alone and see if it ever causes you problems. But again, it's uterus preserving 
and that area of the uterus is getting the same amount of blood supply it used to be, so those fibroids could grow. Okay. So um, as part of this, uh, uh, this paradigm, once we do any kind of procedure, whatever the patient and the doctor feel is most appropriate for each case, uh, we end up getting a follow-up MRI because if we keep the uterus in, we like to get some follow-up information in terms of what else is going on in the uterus. Everything should be behaving and shrinking rather than something new growing. Okay? Excuse me, once you shut off the blood supply to a portion of the uterus, how does that impact that those cells? So, the beauty of this procedure is that you have a uterus and you have a fibroid in it. The fibroid preferentially sucks up the blood going to the uterus. So when I treat it with the tiny particles, it preferentially sucks up the particles. And when I get an MRI afterwards, the muscle of the uterus looks beautiful, it's still enhancing, it's still white, whereas the, u the fibroids are a bunch of black holes. It's a very elegant procedure in that the fibroids almost by virtue of being so greedy in terms of blood supply, sort of end with their own demise. Mm -hmm.